This video will cover the pathophysiology of Parkinson's disease, which is characterized as a neurodegenerative disease as well as a movement disorder. Parkinson's disease, or PD for short, is defined as a progressive degenerative disease of the central nervous system, characterized by the cardinal symptoms of tremor, rigidity, bradykinesia, and postural instability. These characteristics of PD have been recognized for over 200 years. In 1817, in a document titled An Essay on the Shaking Palsy, written by James Parkinson, the description mentioned involuntary tremulous motion, lessened muscular power, and with a propensity to bend the trunk forwards, all of which are characteristic of PD as we know it today. The disease itself would go on to be named after James Parkinson, hence the name Parkinson's disease. Another interesting aspect noted by James Parkinson, who first described the disorder, is that the senses and intellects are uninjured. This is mostly true, as in most cases of Parkinson's disease, sensory function and cognitive ability are not altered. However, as the disease progresses, these may become more and more dysfunctional, as we will see momentarily. Parkinson's disease is the second most common neurodegenerative disease after Alzheimer's, and it currently affects over 1 million people in the United States. The average age of diagnosis for Parkinson's disease is somewhere between the age of 60 and 65. As evidenced by these figures, which display prevalence on the left and incidence on the right, you can see the sharp increase in the number of cases of Parkinson's disease after the 60 to 69 age group. In addition, the risk of Parkinson's disease is slightly higher in men again evidenced by these figures of prevalence and incidence. In general, what we can learn from these images is that the prevalence of and incidence of Parkinson's disease increases over time. As we age, there are more likely to be more cases of Parkinson's disease. In addition, these graphics display the fact that there are more cases in Parkinson's disease in men. In fact, the incidence of Parkinson's disease in women plateaus between the ages of 70 and 79. Said another way, a woman who lives past the age of about 75 years without a Parkinson's diagnosis is not very likely to be diagnosed with Parkinson's after that time. However, a man who lives to the age of 75 or older has a much greater likelihood of being diagnosed with Parkinson's disease as they continue to age. The etiology of Parkinson's disease is complex and involves a combination of genetic changes, environmental risk factors, and cellular dysfunction. We will talk about all of these in turn, but first what I want to do is talk about some of the genetic and environmental risk factors. One thing to note about Parkinson's disease is that approximately 90% of cases are considered sporadic or idiopathic disease, meaning they do not have a single identifiable cause. There are some genetic mutations that are involved in sporadic disease, but these are complicated multifactorial genetic changes that increase the risk of developing Parkinson's disease in those 90% of patients. These can include mutations to the genes for tau protein, which is a brain peptide that is typically um, and more commonly associated with Alzheimer's disease, or mutations in glucocerebrosidase beta acid, or GBA, another protein that is important for brain function. Again, this multifactorial genetic mutation pattern is characteristic for 90% or more of patients with Parkinson's disease. There is a su small subset of patients, about 10%, that are considered to have familial Parkinson's disease because they possess a specific mutation 
that directly connects or links the genetic change to the expression of Parkinson's disease. There are a few genetic changes I will mention as some of these are relevant for the pathophysiology of the disease as well. First, I will describe a couple of autosomal dominant mutations that can lead to familial Parkinson's disease. The autosomal dominant mutations mean that you only need one copy of the mutated gene in order for these mutations to cause the disease. Mutations in the, a protein called alpha-synuclein or a protein called leucine-rich repeat kinase 2 or LARC2 are two primary examples of autosomal dominant familial Parkinson's disease. In both cases, mutations in these genes lead to a very typical or classical presentation of Parkinson's disease. However, there are also cases of duplication or triplication of the alpha-synuclein gene, and these modifications lead to early onset Parkinson's disease. Next, I will mention some mutations that are autosomal recessive and early onset. As autosomal recessive mutations, these modifications require that two copies of the mutation be inherited in order for the pathophysiology of Parkinson's disease to be expressed. All of the mutations in this category lead to an early onset, or in some cases, even juvenile onset Parkinson's disease. These include mutations in the genes that encode Parkin protein, DJ1 protein, and the PINK1 protein. The function of all of these genes and proteins is very complicated, and while we will not talk about most of these, I wanted you to at least be aware or familiar with the terms. The one protein we will spend significant time talking about is alpha-synuclein. For all types of Parkinson's disease, whether familial or sporadic, there are several risk factors that can increase the risk of developing Parkinson's disease. The primary risk factor is age, with there being a greater risk the older that we are. There are some features associated with rural living, like pesticide exposure and drinking well water, that have been shown to increase the risk of developing Parkinson's disease. Lower estrogen and folate deficiency have also been linked with an increased risk for Parkinson's. Interestingly, consumption of caffeine and specifically of coffee have been shown to reduce the risk of developing Parkinson's disease. So don't hesitate to have your morning cup of joe or two or three. PD pathophysiology is characterized by two main pathophysiologic changes. One is neurodegeneration or death of neurons in a specific part of the brain known as the substantia nigra. And the second is the presence of inclusions or protein aggregates called Lewy bodies. We will discuss both of these factors in turn, as well as some additional features of cellular dysfunction and death. First, let's talk about the loss of neurons in the substantia nigra. The substantia nigra is a brain region located in the basal ganglia, or the brain stem, that is important in the control of voluntary movement. Anything like walking, moving, turning, is controlled by the substantia nigra. These neurons originate in the substantia nigra and project to the striatum and are therefore called nigrostriatal neurons. These neurons synthesize and release the neurotransmitter dopamine. And it is this release of dopamine into the striatum that is important for controlling voluntary movement. In Parkinson's disease, nigrostriatal neurons begin to degenerate and die. This leads to a loss of dopamine being released in the striatum. With less dopamine released in the striatum, there is an imbalance of striatal neurotransmitters that leads to the movement features we know are characteristic of Parkinson's disease. Motor impairment is typically not observed until there is at least 75 to 80% cell death meaning that at least three quarters of the nigrostriatal neurons must die before motor dysfunction is observed. 
The severity of Parkinson's disease is directly correlated with how many nigrostriatal neurons have died. The more nigrostriatal degeneration is observed, the more severe motor dysfunction we will see. Nigrostriatal degeneration can be observed in post-mortem or post-death brain tissue by staining for the presence of melanin. These nigrostriatal neurons produce a pigment called melanin, which is colored black, and therefore can be seen by radiography. In the example on the left, we are looking at a cross section through the center of the brainstem where the substantia nigra is the long, skinny strip of tissue indicated by the black coloring. In a control brain, you can see there is significant black pigmentation, which indicates a functioning, healthy substantia nigra. In the half on the right, in a Parkinson's disease patient, you can see the loss of the black pigmentation, which indicates degeneration of the nigrostriatal neurons. A closer look into these neurons is shown in panels B, C, and D. B represents a healthy substantia nigra with that black pigmentation that can be observed, whereas C and D are progressing severity of Parkinson's disease cases where that black pigmentation continues to decrease over time. Here is another image of the degeneration in the substantia nigra using actual tissue slices from human brain rather than radiographic images. The image on the left is a control image where you can see the thin band of black pigmentation indicating a healthy substantia nigra. The image on the right depicts a Parkinson's disease brain where that black pigmentation is lost, indicating nigrostriatal degeneration. The next pathophysiologic feature of Parkinson's disease are what are called Lewy bodies. Lewy bodies are aggregates of protein and debris that are located inside cells or neurons in the brain. These intracellular aggregates contain the protein alpha-synuclein, which is misfolded, as well as other proteins and debris from inside cells. These Lewy bodies can be found throughout the brain, not just in the substantia nigra where the other degenerative pathology is taking place. And in fact, Lewy body pathology appears to spread over time as the disease progresses and becomes more and more severe. Panels E, F, and G depict staining for Lewy bodies inside neurons of the brain. The cl classic or characteristic Lewy body is identified in panel E with a very strongly staining aggregate of protein inside a cell body where you can see the nucleus of the cell shoved to the side a little bit because of this large intracellular aggregate. Lewy body aggregates are also present in neuronal projections as shown in panel F. Panel H depicts the apparent spreading of Lewy pathology over time. As the severity of pathology increases, there are more and more Lewy bodies that can be observed. So in early stages of the disease, you might only see Lewy bodies in lower brainstem regions and the substantia nigra. As the disease progresses to more severe stages, three and up, you can see the spreading of the pathology to higher brainstem regions and to the cortex. As Lewy pathology spreads over the course of the disease, we tend to see additional symptoms like cognitive dysfunction and dementia. Therefore, the extent of Lewy pathology typically correlates with the severity of the disease, with greater Lewy pathology or Lewy body burden being associated with more severe Parkinson's disease symptoms. Beyond the two characteristic pathologic features of neuronal degeneration and Lewy bodies, there are many other processes that are ongoing that contribute to cell death and dysfunction. The primary contributor to cell death and dysfunction is perturbed alpha-synuclein proteostasis, and that is depicted on the left part of this figure here. In general, what is thought to happen is that unfolded alpha-synuclein protein becomes misfolded, 
and starts to form toxic oligomers and eventually um, beta pleated sheets that form the basis for Lewy bodies. The reason that misfolded alpha synuclein protein is thought to form these Lewy bodies is due to a failure of cellular recycling mechanisms like autophagy, lysosome dependent degradation, and the ubiquitin proteasome system. These are all normally trash recycling systems that take care of misfolded proteins and dead or dying proteins inside cells. If these processes become dysfunctional, they can lead to the accumulation of misfolded proteins and the eventual formation of Lewy bodies. However, there are many additional factors that contribute to cell death and dysfunction in Parkinson's disease, and many of these are interrelated as well. Other contributing factors include neuroinflammation due to the presence of activated microglial cells in the brain, oxidative stress due to the presence of reactive oxygen species and increased influx of calcium into cells, mitochondrial dysfunction in which mitochondria become unable to conduct cellular respiration and produce energy for cells as well as impaired calcium homeostasis. All of these factors together are thought to contribute to the degeneration of nigrostriatal neurons. The clinical presentation of Parkinson's disease primarily involves the observation of motor dysfunction. But remember that this motor dysfunction is not typically observed until at least three quarters of the nigrostriatal neurons have died. So realistically, this clinical presentation is late in the disease process. The four cardinal features of Parkinson's disease can be defined by the acronym TRAP. The T stands for tremor, the R for ri rigidity, the A for akinesia, and the P for postural instability. Let's review each of these features in turn. Tremor affects the majority of patients with Parkinson's, but about a quarter of patients will never have tremor. The tremor observed in Parkinson's disease is typically considered a pill rolling tremor because the first thing that is seen is the appearance of someone rolling something between their thumb and forefinger. The tremor is most obvious at rest and actually improves when the patient starts moving. Muscle rigidity is defined as the resistance to movement due to muscle stiffness. This is usually called a cog wheel rigidity because it appears that the person is like a cog in a wheel that's moving very slowly and in short bouts. Akinesia is the absence of movement. Another word that may be used to define this third feature is bradykinesia, which is defined as slow movement. These symptoms include slowness in initiating and maintaining movement. And this is the feature that affects most striated muscles in the body, so most skeletal muscles, and causes the most disability. Postural instability is the loss of normal writing reflexes and typically does not appear until later or more advanced PD. Postural instability is what causes the forward leaning posture of individuals with advanced Parkinson's disease and can also lead to significant disability because it increases the risk for falls. According to the Movement Disorder Society or MDS, the diagnostic criteria for Parkinson's disease include two steps. The first is to diagnose Parkinsonism in general, which is to look for those four core features of Parkinson's that we just talked about. Bradykinesia or slow movement must be present, plus one of the other cardinal signs we discussed. So this is shown in the box on the left as the presence of bradykinesia, plus the combination of either rigidity or a resting tremor. This simply indicates that there is underlying Parkinsonian features, but does not yet unequivocally diagnose Parkinson's disease as the cause of Parkinsonism. This is important because there are other situations and conditions that can produce a Parkinson-like phenotype that are not Parkinson's disease. 
the most common of which is antipsychotic-induced Parkinsonism, as well as other drug-induced Parkinsonian syndromes. To diagnose Parkinson's disease specifically, you have to determine two levels of diagnostic certainty to establish uh, clinical Parkinson's disease, which means you have to have all three of the listed parameters. You have to exclude all other criteria that could be responsible for Parkinsonism, such as drug-induced Parkinsonism or essential tremor. Additional supportive criteria include responsiveness to dopamine medications. So the fact that a patient might respond to a dopamine replacement medication is indicative that it is Parkinson's disease. And finally, no additional red flags. Red flags are other features that are unusual uh, for clinical Parkinson's disease, but may be more common to another underlying cause. For example, um, the rapid progression of gait impairment that requires wheelchair use or the development of severe autonomic failure. These would be considered red flags and would exclude a Parkinson's diagnosis. In addition to the motor symptoms of Parkinson's, patients with this disorder typically experience several non-motor symptoms. These can be classified as either autonomic symptoms or other. Autonomic dysfunction includes things like increased sweating or diaphoresis, increased activity of sebaceous glands and production of sebum or skin oil, excessive salivation and lacrimation, trouble swallowing or dysphagia, the presence of orthostatic hypotension, constipation, impotence, and incontinence. Other symptoms associated with non-motor features of Parkinson's are excessive daytime sleepiness, depression, dementia, and the loss of the sense of smell or anosmia. One important thing to note about Parkinson's disease is that the symptoms do not appear all at once. Rather, they begin to appear slowly over time as the disease progresses and becomes more and more severe. There's a very characteristic pattern of appearance of both motor and non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. The prodromal period of Parkinson's disease is characterized by primarily non-motor symptoms and it is not likely that Parkinson's disease would be diagnosed during this time, giving, given the nonspecific nature of many of these symptoms. These include things like REM behavior disorder, depression, anxiety, constipation, anosmia, and excessive daytime sleep, sleepiness. The end of the prodromal period is characterized by the onset of motor symptoms, and eventually the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease upon evaluation or presence of bradykinesia, rigidity, and or tremor. These are the classic motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease and begin early stage Parkinson's disease period. This period of time is characterized by progression of motor symptoms, as well as new onset of the non-motor symptoms, fatigue, pain, and possibly some mild cognitive impairment. Mid-stage Parkinson's disease is characterized by the additional onset of motor fluctuations and dyskinesias, which are more commonly associated with pharmacologic treatment rather than the underlying disease itself. This period is also characterized by new onset of the non-motor symptoms of incontinence and orthostatic hypotension. Late stage Parkinson's disease is characterized by the motor symptoms of dysphagia, postural instability, and falls, as well as the non-motor symptoms of psychosis and dementia. Late in the late stage period is when institutionalization may need to occur and eventually the period of death where many of these motor and non-motor symptoms become quite severe and disable the patient significantly. 
patient assessment in Parkinson's disease includes both an evaluation of motor features as well as a complete neurologic exam. There are several ways in which the severity of Parkinson's disease is evaluated. The first is a staging scale called the Hone and Yar staging, in which stage one is considered early or less severe Parkinson's disease from two to three, et cetera, with increasing dis disability and decreasing independence. Initially, Parkinson's disease may begin asymmetrically, meaning, meaning that symptoms are only observed on one side of the body. This is considered Hone and Yar stage one. Eventually, Parkinson's motor symptoms will move to involve both sides of the body, and when bilateral symptoms are observed, this is Hone and Yar stage two. Patients at this stage have no balance impairment. When balance becomes impaired, and there are impaired postural reflexes observed, but the patient is still physically independent, this is Hone and Yar stage three. Hone and Yar stage four is when severe disability is observed, but patients are able to still walk or stand unassisted. And stage five is wheelchair bound or bedridden. There is also the Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale, or UPDRS. This is really the clinical gold standard for evaluating the severity and progression of Parkinson's disease and covers many different areas in addition to motor features, such as behavior, mood, and activities of daily living. An example of the first page is shown on this slide, but there are several pages of evaluation that are required in order to complete the full UPDRS. The prognosis for Parkinson's disease is fairly good considering there are several medications available to help treat the symptoms of the disease. Some of the problematic complications that are less easily treated with pharmacologic agents include dementia and depression. And these become more and more prominent as the disease progresses. Eventually, individuals may have difficulty walking, communicating, and possibly chewing and swallowing, which can lead to difficulty with eating and maintaining weight. Problems with balance and coordination can lead to falls in which a bone may be broken, as we described earlier. To monitor patients with Parkinson's disease, the intended outcome and plan for treatment varies depending on the age of onset of the disease, as well as the presence of other comorbidities and the quality of care that a patient is receiving. Pneumonia is actually the leading cause of death in individuals with Parkinson's disease who become wheelchair bound or bedridden. Now try your hand at applying some of these features to a case in Access Pharmacy. Go ahead and snap a photo of the QR code on the screen to directly access the Parkinson's disease pathophysiology case.